Hi, this is Joe. No, that's not today. That oh wait, what day is today? Oh, convocation is today. Yeah, no, no, I'm I'm ready to go. It is not a problem. I can be at the Wilson Center in two minutes. All right, let's go. Okay, we made it. Let's get this party started. We're all here. Well, we're here. You're not quite all here. So I guess these can come off. I say, ah, oh, let's get this party started. Good morning and welcome to Convocation 2020. I'm Professor of Speech Communication, Joe LaBarbera, and we'd like to welcome you to what is a little bit different of a convocation than we're used to. And I am so delighted to once again serve as your MC. Obviously, this year's ceremony looks a little bit different than it has in years past, but hopefully you're just as excited as I am to kick off this virtual academic year. Now, over the past five plus months, we've all been working remotely. We've all been getting used to working in our PJs. Maybe some of you are still working to dress to impress. Maybe you've become friends with your Amazon driver, and maybe some of you have come to accept that. Your kids think the sound of that logging into WebEx is a call for snack time. Term shelter in place, well, working remotely, they mean different things to different people. So we asked you to send in videos to give us a closer look at your new daily lives. And we'll be showing these throughout today's program. Now, with all of the change and uncertainty we faced, one thing we can safely say is that we're hoping all of you are going to be in for a much more conventional year than what we've been working through right now. Now, while we don't see your smiling faces here today, we still want to hear from you. This is your opportunity to actually participate and provide feedback to the big cheeses here at FSCJ, you know, FSCJ administration. And we'll do that throughout the ceremony by asking you a few poll questions. You'll see the poll question pop up right on your screen. All you have to do is just check the right box. Now, if you're watching on your phone and you have it turned horizontally, you may need to go this way into portrait, not landscape, so that you can see all the questions. Don't worry, all of the answers are anonymous. And I hope you're ready because here comes the first poll question. First question, how are you all feeling about all of the changes and the new processes implemented here at FSCJ over the past five months? Now, the choices are A, working remotely was an adjustment, but I'm embracing the changes and I'm excited for the new academic year. Or B, Working, uh, I miss my desk, I miss my office, I miss my colleagues, I can't wait to return to campus. Or C, let's just fast forward to 2021 and pretend like nothing happened over this past year. You know, like when Dr. Avendano pretends the Packers didn't beat the Bears. While we're tallying your answers, you have an opportunity to see some of your coworkers. Now, whether they're welcome additions to your new office space or not. Hi everybody, it's Karen Arlington. I'd like to introduce you to my favorite co-worker and FSCJ's newest workforce education specialist. He's been at my side since the day we came back. And I think when we go back to work, he has to come because I'm now his emotional support person. Happy Convocation Day. Lynn Noble here. I thought I would share what it's like to teach mathematics from home. I have a supervisor. He's always looking over my shoulders and he's extremely critical of my work. When I try to do conferences with my students, that's when they want attention. It wasn't enough to keep the door behind me closed. They still scratched and cried and clawed to get in. The solution, the vacuum cleaner. They will not come near it. Which is falling water. So, oh my God. Hello, my name is Harvey Slintz. I teach business law and employment law here at the college. This has been a really interesting spring and summer for us, and I wanted to share with you some of the ways that I spend my time by showing you my office. I'll turn the camera around so you can see it. As you can see, the office has plenty of books, 
an open window, and one of my assistants is a skeleton. That's my skeleton crew. If you look around, you'll also see I've got one desk there with a the laptop. I've got another skeleton behind there helping me with another laptop and a book that I've been reading, The End of Epidemics. I don't think it's timely now. But all this keeps me busy, and my wife is kind enough to let me out of my office a couple of times uh, a day. So it really works well. I hope yours is equally good. Wow, some great, great videos, and I think that was a black racer made that way into somebody's garage. My goodness. Well, we have our first poll results. Amazingly, 62% of you chose A, working remotely was an adjustment, but I'm embracing the new year, uh, the new changes, and I'm excited for the new year. So now it's time to get the program started, and we'll do that by introducing the Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs, and we have to do this properly. From Penn State at six foot two, 198 pounds, please welcome Dr. John Wall. Thank you, Joe, I think. Good morning, colleagues. Welcome to our virtual 2020 convocation ceremony. This year's theme is evolving with innovation, passion, perseverance, and purpose. Because this has been such a great time of change for all of us, both individually and as a college. This time has also presented us with some experiences where further change will be necessary to our ways of life. And today, we welcome the opportunity to speak about those things. We're all fortunate to be part of this amazing Team FSCJ. Over the past several months, we have witnessed some incredible examples of teamwork, ingenuity, and dedication of our chief cause, which is to make high quality education possible for all students in our community. This has certainly been a trying time, but it's also been a time of growth. I just want to thank you for partnering with us, for going above and beyond, and for being flexible and innovative as we've navigated these uncharted waters. In the midst of all the disruption and adaption, convocation is a welcome touch point where we can take a moment to re-engage the annual rhythm of our work. For example, each year, we are pleased to recognize an especially remarkable group of faculty and staff who are nominated by colleagues and students to receive our APC, CEC, and faculty awards. I'm certain you have seen the communications that were shared with the names of this year's recipients, but I'd like to once again acknowledge each of them. Let me begin with the 2020 Distinguished Faculty Award recipients. Professor of Anthropology, Dr. Brad Biglow. Professor of Logistics, Dr. Johnny Bowman. Professor of Business and Accounting, Dr. Shauna Corum. Professor of English, Suzanne Hess. And Professor of Early Childhood Education, Dr. Reno Tarasiano. Sorry, Reno. <laughs> congratulations, congratulations to all of you, and thanks for being examples of FSCJ teaching at our very best. In the same vein, I'd like to say thank you to our outstanding and talented core of adjunct faculty and to recognize our distinguished adjunct faculty award winner this year. Congratulations, Professor Brian Wiley. We're pleased also to congratulate the Administrative and Professional Collaborative Exceptional Service and Initiative Award recipient, Dean of Communications, Dr. Jeff Hess and the Career Employees Council Recognition of Excellence Award recipient is Student Services Administrative Support Manager, Brian Stewart. Congratulations to you, Brian. As you tuned in this morning, I'm sure you probably saw the slides with the names of employees who are celebrating years of service milestones, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, and even 45 years of service. Normally by this time, you would have had a reception to celebrate your time with the college. Please know we have not forgotten about you. You'll hear about our formal recognition plans soon. There's another very important group of people who believe in our institution's mission and purpose so strongly that they generously volunteer their valuable time to work alongside us, helping us to achieve our goals and making a way for our students to do the same. I would like to take a moment to recognize and thank 
the members of our district board of trustees. Our board chair, Mr. Thomas Mack McGee. Mr. Michael Bell, our Nassau County Vice Chair. Mr. Wayne Young, our Duval County Vice Chair. Dr. Jennifer Brown, Ms. Chantel Davis, Ms. Laura DeBella, Mr. Hunt Hawkins, Mr. Tom Madonix, and Mr. Roderick Odom. We are grateful for your dedication, your support and guidance, and the call to excellence that you ring out for everyone who is part of the FSCJ professional family. It's also my honor this morning to acknowledge my fellow members of the Executive Cabinet. Dr. Marie Nagy, Vice President of Institutional Effectiveness and Advancement. Dr. Linda Herlocker, Vice President of Student Services. Ms. Jana Coy, Vice President of Online and Workforce Education. Mr. Al Little, Vice President of Business Services. And Ms. Lisa Moore, Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer. I consider myself extremely fortunate to be a part of this leadership group and of the broader FSCJ family, especially for opportunities to work with all of you, our dedicated faculty and staff. You all deserve to be recognized for all you continue to do on a daily basis for the good of our students, especially over the last several months. Now, within our professional family, there's an especially dedicated group of colleagues who have been stationed on our campuses and centers while most of us have been working remotely. Their efforts should not go unnoticed because they have kept us going. They are the reason that we will be able to return safely when the time is right. To our facility staff, thank you for keeping our facilities and point of pride for FSCJ. And to our security team, we cannot thank you enough for all you do to keep us safe. And finally, because we are an institution of higher learning that values lifelong education and ongoing professional development, I'd also like to recognize all who have gone on to complete a degree or certificate program this past year, either here at FSCJ or at another educational institution. We applaud your commitment to your educational goals and congratulate your success. Please allow us to honor you by officially going through the earned degree recognition process. Information about that process can be found on the HR website, or you can email employment at fscj.edu if you have any questions. We're hopeful that many of you have completed one or more professional development activities over the past academic year, whether through our own programming, at a conference, or a convention. Your personal and professional growth makes FSCJ stronger. I thank you for your time. I wish you a great start to the new academic year. And I will pass the program back over to my favorite MC, Joe LaBarbera. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wall. You know, one of the big parts of all of the issues that we're dealing with now is cleaning. And there's no difference because we don't have an audience here at FSCJ uh, that we're also cleaning the podium and getting everything ready just as they have been doing all summer long and all throughout the spring and this issue. Thank you, Dr. Wall. Uh, I know the past several months have been challenging for all of us, but our students have been working just as hard as ever and they're ad adjusting to all of these new changes uh, in the new ways of learning on top of everything else they have to do, their daily activities, their job and their life. Thanks for all of you for everything that you've been doing to help them get through this crazy time. Hi, my name is Shakora. I am a wife and mother of five. I'm also a student. I recently decided to come back to FSCJ to finish my associate's degree. Uh, I started in the spring. I was taking two classes and they shortly after went from on campus to online. At first that was really scary. Um, I was a little frustrated because the first time I took an online class, I failed it. It was really hard for me. But my experience this time during the transition to remote learning was amazing. I have two professors right now um, that have made it super easy for me. Uh, Dr. Kaysen for my humanities class and Dr. Masterzo for my women's studies class. Uh, Dr. Kaysen is very patient. He's 
uh, very ava available to uh, answer questions. He has a live discussion. Uh, the first half hour, he just answers questions, any questions we might have. And he also um, answers emails and phone calls. Uh, Dr. Mesterzo is very involved in the class. She made it the uh, class so far. It's very fun. Uh, she's always communicating with us and keeping her line open as well. So the communication has been uh, amazing and it's made the transition for me so much easier. I'm so thankful for um, the online courses, courses the way that they've been conducting them. So I appreciate the transition so far. My experience with quarantine so far has been pretty boring to say the least. Uh, not being able to go out with friends and hang out with people and uh, going out, not being able to go out to places I'd like to go out to has made life pretty bland. Uh, not to mention not being able to work as well. Uh, but with that being said, school is still a top priority for me personally. And so with that being said, I've still had to participate in remote learning. and. Um, the transition to remote learning has been pretty straightforward so far, actually. Uh, my professors made that really easy for me because they've been recording our classes um, as videos, our, our class sessions, and uploading them to uh, Google Drive. Or they leave them up as recordings on um, Canvas conferences for us to rewatch. And that's made the transition to remote learning a lot easier because sometimes uh, during the live class sessions, um, if things get uh, mixed up or if I get confused about something, um, you know, before with uh, normal live in-person classes, uh, you can always ask the professor, you can always raise your hand and ask them questions live, or you can ask them questions uh, after class or before class, um, or you can email them as well. Um, but being able to rewatch a video and pause it if I need to, or rewind and go over something again that I, that I might have missed or I've gotten confused on, has made remote learning a lot easier for me personally. Thank you so much to all of our students who have gone above and beyond through some of these really challenging times. And thanks to you, whether you're in a faculty role or an academic support staff or whatever your role is in helping our students move forward. And there are a lot of things that we're doing here at FSCJ to better assist students on their academic journey. Now, we have a special video that was put together by Director of Academic and Student Achievement, Sarah Reardon. And uh, to share more with us about this college's new initiative, it's called My Grad Plan. It helps students as they map out their academic journey. Sarah has asked fellow colleagues to help explain more about the project. But before we play that video, we do have another quick poll question for you. By the way, over 400 responses to our last poll question. Here's the new poll question for you. What is an academic roadmap? One of the multiple choices on your screen. Uh, a, for students earning an AA degree, roadmaps are a term-by-term -term course sequence plan based on intended major or program of study. B, an AA roadmap helps an AA student accurately select the appropriate courses so they can seamlessly transfer to a bachelor's degree at FSCJ or at another university. C, AA roadmaps are developed by faculty and academic advisors. Or D, all of the above. We'll review the results after this video. Jacksonville is a city of bridges, so it's very intentional that our college's Title III grant program is named Bridges. A bridge is inherently a symbol of union, and although our name alludes to our area's landscape, it also symbolizes purposeful unions among our departments here at FSCJ. Under the Bridges grant program, we are bringing together faculty and staff to work on integrated student success efforts. Although there are many bridges of collaboration we are developing through our grant program, today I wanted to share with you the latest developments and one of the transformative efforts we've been working on. This past academic year, two teams comprised of faculty and staff developed over 70 Associate of Arts roadmaps. These roadmaps are a set of clear course-taking patterns that promotes better enrollment decisions and prepares our students for future success. These roadmaps will be integrated into our new student success management tool called EAB Navigate, which we are rebranding as FSCJ's My Grad Plan. I've asked a few colleagues from the development teams to give us updates on both the roadmaps and My Grad Plan. Can you give us a little bit more detail on the process of the roadmap development? 
Florida's meta majors or career clusters provided a logical organizing framework for our project because there are eight meta majors into which the various AA degree programs naturally fall from arts, humanities, communications and design to science, technology, engineering and mathematics. And with that overarching framework in mind, we then applied some of the best practices of guided pathways, which entail bringing together a cross-divisional team of faculty and student success advisors who, through their collective expertise, design the roadmaps and course sequencing lists and bring to that effort their disciplinary knowledge, their knowledge of course sequencing, as well as degree planning. I would love to know, what did you learn from the Faculty Advisor Partnership? One of the things that I learned was you get what you model. And for me, it was the big why. We had an opportunity to see why faculty would recommend one course before another. And faculty got an opportunity to see that advisors are advising students on the best course to take within their program to match what the faculty is recommending. Uh, this past year, you helped the college design some of the top 70 Associate of Arts to Bachelor Roadmaps with other faculty members and advisors. Can you talk a little bit about what you learned from the experience? Uh, I had a conversation with my team member, Dr. Shauna Coram, and I really was uh, agreeing with something that she was talking about um, related to course sequencing. Um, it can be so critical for some majors um, to progress smoothly and not end up with excess credit hours. Um, some students just don't know how to plan. Some incoming students are not aware of how to plan for proper course sequencing. And then they're also afraid to ask for help. Um, these roadmaps will give them a jumping off point that they wouldn't otherwise have. You mentioned in our last call about the system is going to help students. As a faculty member, it's going to be helpful for you because students are going to be better prepared going into your course. Can you speak a little bit about that? Well, if they know where the what the destination the is mm -hmm. and they know where this class fits in that pathway, then I expect them to know where they're going. And sometimes students sign up because somebody said, well, I, I think I need to take this class or it's on the list of classes I need to take, but it may not be the best order that they should take them in because our roadmap and the way our curriculum is, it's not real specific, but this will be able to give them better guidance about the sequencing that they should use. Dr. Richman, how are these AA to bachelor roadmaps going to help students? So I'd say the, the biggest benefit to a roadmap is that it, it shows the student from the outset what their degree can look like. And that's a huge metacognitive tool for students to be able to see completion from the time that they start so that they're not on an expedition wondering what courses they should take. And so it really helps them envision themselves in the classes down the road and finishing their degree, which is just, you know, that's a huge benefit to students. We know that it improves their retention. Um, in fact, here at FSCJ, with the degree plans we've created for students, we've seen double digit increases in retention for those students who have a degree plan or a plan mapped out for them. So just, it really helps the student uh, envision and then psychologically helps them persist. So Jennifer, in your opinion, what is my grad plan's greatest benefit for the advisor student relationship and interaction? So what EAB is going to allow us to do and, and navigate is it's going to allow us to have a student ready when they sit down for that plan so that we're not spending so much time explaining what the course requirements are, or what a general education requirement is, you know, let's go through and look at all the different humanities options. Students will already have that information coming in the door because they're going to get it right on their phones. They're going to get it when they log in to navigate because they're going to be able to see that under the My Plan option. So Dr. Herlocker, can you tell us more about My Grad Plan's features? I think some members of our community might ask what makes it different than any other tool we currently have. Sure. So My Grad Plan in its simplest form is a student success case management system 
that provides students with a very clear roadmap and pathway to their academic goal. And then it connects them with the resources and people that will help them get there. It's just as simple as that. Now, to make that happen, you mentioned a lot of features. So um, on the student facing side of it, it provides things like um, guided onboarding. So students will have a much easier time coming to us once they get through the admissions process. We can take them through uh, a very careful um, pathway in which they'll do some career exploration. We'll make sure they're in the right major. We'll make sure that they do their orientation. We'll get all that stuff right up front and that will save a lot of backtracking and undoing uh, once they're already in their programs. It also provides to students milestone guidance so they know when there are important hoops that they should be hitting along the way and it'll give them nudges to let them know what they should be doing. It gives them customized reminders. That's the nudges I was talking about. And it gives them, um, I talked about a very defined degree pathway. So students no longer will be confronted with a giant catalog of, you know, 500 or so courses from which they have to choose. Instead, they'll be, the courses will be sequenced for them. And it will tell them what they should be taking in their first semester, their second semester and so forth, based on whether they're full-time or part-time, what days of the week they can attend classes, their learning preferences um, for in-person hybrid or distance learning and so forth. It makes registration easier for them mm. in, that, in that sense. The courses that they will be presented with for registration will be immediately aligned with their expected progression uh, according to those degree pathways that are defined. Can you give updates on uh, the My Grad Plan timeline? When will students be able to access it? And what about advisors and faculty? Great question, Sarah. So first, we are scheduled to go live with the staff facing side of My Grad Plan in the fall of 2021. That means the system needs to be ready. Advisors need to be trained. Faculty need to be trained around mid-April of 2021 when enrollment opens for the term to support student registration. We plan to go live with the student facing side, including the app spring term 2022. That means the students need to be, have training material pushed out to them and the system needs to be fully up and live to support registration. So that's around October of 2021. And then we plan to go live with that registration component, that one click registration in the summer of 2022. So really, when you think about the registration cycle, that means it needs to, we need to be trained and fully live and ready to go in February of 2022. Thanks to Sarah and everyone for sharing more on this exciting initiative and what we can expect as they roll this out over the next couple of years. If you'd like to watch those full interviews, visit the Florida State College Jacksonville YouTube channel. Now it's time for our poll results. Guess what? 95% response was D, all of the above. You didn't know there was going to be a test today. <laughs> That's the correct answer is D, all of the above. And, I, and we know how hard it can be to stay focused and on task while working from home, but by now I'm sure you've gotten into some kind of routine uh, on your own. And some of you have even found new ways to stay active while working through your to-do list. Hi, my name is Diane Fair. I teach biology at the ATC. And what has kept me sane during the pandemic is kickboxing. It's a good exercise, keeps you sound of mind and body and it's generally not appropriate to punch other people in the face. My home office has a stand-up desk, which I always wanted. So this chair becomes a bar for doing deep knee bends. I can do arm lifts, stretches. And while I might not be ready for Broadway, I am able to serve with more energy our patrons in the FSCJ Artist Series. Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Jamie Burton, and it's been a crazy year. We've had a crazy spring and an even more crazy summer, but you know what? We're here, fall is here, and it's time for a new academic year. So keep dancing and be happy. Thanks everybody and Dr. Burton for keeping it so positive and uplifting. You know, now it's time to welcome one of the most gifted and talented people that I've had the pleasure of working with here at FSCJ. Professor of Speech, Dr. Mary Lee Canill, 
Now, Dr. Knill recently moderated a virtual panel of faculty and staff that's focusing on some of the relevant events and topics that we're experiencing here in our community, in our nation, and across the world. Dr. Knill. Thank you so much, Joe. And we just wanted to start off today by saying that our thoughts are with you, Jacob Blake, and your family, and all the citizens of Kenosha, Wisconsin today. On June 30th of this year, an article published in the Boston Globe cited a psychology professor at the University of California, Irvine, who specializes in anger assessment and treatment as saying, quote, we are living in effect in an anger incubator. The chair of the American Psychiatric Association's Committee on the Psychiatric Dimensions of Disaster observed, quote, three disasters superimposed on top of one another, the pandemic, economic fallout, and civil unrest have Americans seeing increased stress, worry, and anger. Understanding that this is our current climate, we at FSCJ are positioned to lead the charge in channeling these situations into productivity and growth. So today, we're talking about our capacity to strengthen FSCJ as a safe space. Physically, we have our plans for sanitation, social distancing, and mask, but also to be a safe space mentally and emotionally. Research demonstrates that when we create a safe space where people feel supported being their authentic selves, we see increases in innovation and collaboration. This support and empowerment create a space for new thoughts and ideas and the resiliency for us to make some mistakes and learn from them. Now is the time to be having some challenging conversations to discuss what safety looks like to varying individuals and achieve and model inclusive excellence. FSCJ is positioned to be the place these discussions are happening. We have the diversity to pull on to create a table of diverse points of view where they can be heard and addressed. In both our classrooms and through the ripple effect of our graduates becoming thought leaders in our community, we are the space to be discussing challenging topics, making hard decisions, and establishing a model for what inclusive excellence looks like, both at the college and within our city. So today we're gathered around the table with all of our exceptional panelists, a lot of diversity from all different areas of the college to start this conversation about inclusive excellence. And then FSCJ, later we're gonna invite you to the table to get involved as well. So first, our first panelist is Lisa Moore, Chief Diversity Officer. Then we have Kathy Horn, Director of Campus Operations. Hi, Kathy. Then we have Christopher Lee, Professor of Information Technology. Hey, Chris. Dr. Monica Franklin, Instructional Program Manager of Health Sciences. Good morning, Monica. Dr. Heather Kenny, Director of Campus Center Enrollment and Student Services. Hi, Heather. And Carrie Roth, Associate Director of Student Life and Leadership. Hi, Carrie. So thank you all so much for being here. So during this time of COVID and quarantine, there's been a lot of unprecedented challenges. And after the flu of 1918, that actually created a space for a lot of innovation. So just a, something that came out of that was we didn't even know what a virus was before that. So after 1918, all the research that was done um, helped us discover viruses. It helped us discover how to create them in eggs so that we could study them more. And then we were able to make a mass vaccine for everybody. And then the tools that we used for that also led to the discovery of DNA and genetic materials and how all of that functions. So thinking about this unprecedented time and all of the innovations that could come out of it, what are some different or innovative approaches that you have explored during this time. So Chris, why don't you start us off? Okay, will do. Thank you. Um, in, the, in the IT program here, some of our students have never actually touched the inside of a computer or they've never worked behind the scenes of managing a computer system, configuring operating systems or setting up network devices. And unfortunately, this distance learning has prevented them from getting this experience here in our campus labs. So I've actually set up a little miniature um, computer lab here in my bedroom, my spare bedroom. I call it my home teaching studio. Um, 
as I'm lecturing, students can actually see what I'm doing on each of the computers and they can ask questions in real time. Now, of course, there's a lot of virtual things out there that they can work with. There are a lot of videos that they can watch, but being actually, being actually able to see it being done live in real time <clears throat> and ask questions and give feedback and see me make mistakes, that's a very valuable experience for them. And in place of some of the hands-on labs, I come up with some scenarios and I ask them to tell me what to do in order to fix the problems. This allows me to convey as much of a in-person experience as possible. And over the summer, I work with some of our um, IT department members here at the college, as well as one of my interns. Um, we set up a remote server configuration lab. Uh, starting in the fall, students will be able to configure and manage this network of 12 servers from their homes. And this is actually similar to what they'll be doing in the real world because many of the um, servers and network devices that people work with, they're like hundreds or thousands of miles away, locked away in some kind of closet or data center. So this experience will actually prepare them for the real world. So we've been fairly creative um, throughout this whole thing. I love that so much, Chris. And I love the application to the real world because we didn't think that we would all be interacting this way, but we definitely need your students. So Kathy, why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience during this time? The work life for college-wide maintenance and security has not changed a lot during the pandemic. Our campuses need to be secured, buildings and grounds maintained. So from the beginning, maintenance, plant service, and security have been considered essential employees and we have been on campus. Starting in March, the college experienced the same challenges as other businesses with obtaining needed cleaning supplies and personal protective equipment for our employees. Masks for maintenance, maintenance and security was a real issue. They just were not available. So we reached out to the costume crew, which is a local small business who designs and sews costumes for our fine arts program to see if they could help us. They made the first reusable mask for maintenance and security, and this was a great solution. One of our security chiefs had a contact with JSO, who gave us a lead to another local company who was providing hand sanitizer for their departments. At that time, if you could find a supplier with it in stock, hand sanitizer was selling for $90 a gallon. But with this resource, we were able to obtain hand sanitizers for our classrooms and labs for less than $20 a gallon which was a great savings for the college. Obtaining barrier shields, cleaning supplies, hand sanitizers and wipes have been a challenge, but with all the campuses working together, utilizing the contacts and resources we have, we have obtained adequate supplies for fall and summer term face-to-face -face classes. Kathy, that's awesome. And I wish I was quick at math because I can't even imagine how much money you saved the college. Thank you so much. All right, and Carrie, why don't you fill us in on what you've been up to? Sure. When the decision was made to move to an online modality, Student Life and Leadership met with our counterparts from across the state to exchange best practices. We attended webinars and re researched what other colleges and universities were doing around the country to engage our students virtually. Uh, Student Life and Leadership quickly met during spring break to create live, passive, and informational programming in Canvas and social media. During the spring and summer uh, terms, our student leaders have been help, helping to plan and create um, virtual programming that has occurred during the summer and during uh, the upcoming fall term. Uh, this fall, Student Life and Leadership uh, will utilize uh, WebEx um, and also tying into our Life at FSCJ Canvas cor uh, course to have more breakout sessions and have live events during the fall that our students can engage in. Carrie, I love that. And that's also a great opportunity for people to get involved. Um, I was on one of the call-ins where students wanted to talk about race, which leads into our next question. So during this time of COVID and quarantine, um, and over the past few months since the death of George Floyd, we've seen this outcry for justice and to reimagine our country and to look at where we came from and how we got here. And one of the analogies that I've heard is that it was like baking a cake. And if we baked a cake and racism was one of the original ingredients, it's all in there now and we can't parse it out afterwards. So we have to bake a new cake. So if we think about FSCJ as being a place where we can start baking this new cake, 
What are some of the ways that we can be thought leaders in our community um, on really moving diversity forward? So going from talk to action and really creating this inclusive excellence. Why don't we start with Heather? Good morning, everyone. You know, as I think of what inclusion looks like for the students and really thinking of through as far as what is an intentional and active environment to learn in, um, we really look to have excellence in everything that we do in student services specifically, you know, embedding all those aspects of the student life as they come in and meet with an academic advisor or they see us, you know, finding advisor um, and really working to connect those individuals to increase their awareness and we have students every day when we were on campus you know before we had students every day in our lives that we might have an immigrant family that is sitting next to a mom that's coming back with her three children next to a dual enrollment student and so just the inclusion within our offices on any given day but then to be able to interact with an advisor that's going to give that awesome experience and tell them how to get to the next level is even more important so being able to show that um, inclusivity in our offices now that we're online we still see those same students we're just seeing them in their homes right we're talking to them you know talking with our students so i think that every day is an interaction that should be an open conversation in that safe environment for the student that's so true heather and chris what's your vision of inclusive excellence at fscj um, so for me, being a member of the faculty, it looks like faculty and staff who have these great ideas on how to serve the students that we work with every day, as well as pr prospective students who are looking to join us. We act with these students every day and we have these ideas on how to serve them. So we need administrators who provide the resources to bring those ideas to life. Uh, for example, prior to COVID, I was hosting a middle school robotics team here on campus. And we want to set up some um, large competition tables in South uh, 102. That's one of the um, rooms that I use for teaching. So I figured just use one of the rooms that I already have access to, and that'll be most convenient for me. But when I met with Kathy Horn, she took time to show us several other alternative spaces so that we could have more room, additional security, easier access to classrooms, things that I hadn't um, thought about. So in the end, we decided to use another space over at the ATC, but I really appreciated Kathy's diligence in making sure that we had the best pace, best space, best environment possible for what we were trying to do. And earlier I mentioned the um, server configuration lab and the other question. Um, that actually began as a small temporary network in one of our classrooms. And then it grew to what was supposed to be a permanent location in a larger classroom, but then Canvas came and we haven't used it since. So now that we're moving it on to the, um, the network so students can have access to it, I've really thought about the evolution of this project. You know, throughout this project, you know, I've had the team, the support of my dean, my academic director, their staff, the campus um, operations, the IT department. We all work together to make this idea come to life because no one single person could make it happen on our own. So here at FSCJ, I feel like we have significant resources, and that was one of the things that really attracted me to the college when I came to interview here. But it's all up to us to put those resources to the best use possible. We can't just sit on our laurels and say, well, you know, this is the way that we've always done things, and we don't really want to change because we put so much time into getting it this way. We can't do that. We have to be open to the new ideas um, that will address our current situation, our current reality, so that we'll be able to prepare our students for the future. Thank you so much, Chris. And I love that you talked about cl collaboration and creativity because that's gonna come back up later as one of the hallmarks of innovation. So awesome, Chris, great job. Um, Lisa, what would inclusive excellence look like to you? Good morning. Um, inclusive excellence to me says that we're continually striving to ensure that FSCJ is an open space, a safe space, 
a place where people feel respected and a place where people feel supported. And that's whether you're students, faculty, staff, or even the community when they interact with us. I think it also means that we, we intentionally value ideas at the table, all ideas, all perspectives. And we can agree to disagree. We can agree that that's not going to work for us right now. But if I feel like I can come to the table and share my perspective, wherever that comes from, whether it's from, um, as, as I was listening to Heather, I'm a mom going back to work and going back to school, or I'm, an, I'm, I'm a first generation student from an immigrant family, or I have been displaced, unfortunately, by COVID, and this is my second or third career. But I feel like I can be heard. I feel like I can be supported. And again, for me, inclusive excellence will ultimately become our norm. We work really hard here. We support and value each other, but we continually need to strive to do that. And so we're not having to think do I have all the all ideas and perspectives at the table? It is just the way of work. It is just what we do at FSCJ, and it is just how we treat each other at FSCJ. I love that. And I, I love the idea that you can bring your authentic self, also a key for innovation. And I love the idea that eventually it just disappears and we're all diverse and we don't even have to think about it. Um, but to get to that point, we may have to do a little bit of work. Uh, so the inventions that came from the 1918 flu and many social movements started in colleges and universities. So we're uniquely positioned for new ideas and being innovative. So thinking about us at FSCJ, um, how can we really put things in, in process to move from talk to action? And not only here at FSCJ, but how can we create inclusive excellence across our city. So why don't we start with you, Monica? Thank you for that um, question. So when I'm thinking about diversity and how we can um, improve and increase diversity at FSCJ, I think first we need to determine if the diversity that we currently have, does that truly mirror the diversity of the population and the community that we serve? That type of diversity should be existent. It should be present throughout our organization um, in all areas. So from leadership to entry level employees, we all know that diversity, it's not just about race, but diversity, it really includes all of our individual uniquenesses. It includes our mental and our physical abilities. It includes our intellectual and our ideological diversity. So it's, it includes many, many things. Oftentimes organizations, they participate in targeted um, recruitment or they recruit outside of the geographic area that they're located in, really in an effort to increase diversity. I think that diversity should really be self-sustaining. And if it's not self-sustaining, why isn't it um, self-sustaining? And we have to really look at the, the climate and the culture of the organization. So if the climate truly is inclusive, if it's really inclusive, then minorities will more likely, they will be more engaged and they will be more productive and they will more likely have a great sense of job satisfaction. So everyone deserves an opportunity to have equal access um, to career paths. And within these career paths, individuals should have the tools and resources, they should have the support, and they should have the opportunities to travel these various career paths. So at FSCJ, we have many mentors and many organizations utilize the mentoring model. And Unfortunately, many times the mentees are a younger version of the mentor. So I submit that the majority of the mentors should select mentees who don't look, act, think like they do. So, you know, diversity really is including ideas and thoughts from individuals who see the world differently than we see the world. 
So when it comes to diversity, I think that FSCJ really does need to assess and acknowledge where we currently are. We need to plan, we need to implement, and we need to continuously evaluate where we are. So for our FSCJ reality and for the model um, for the city and beyond, it should be that our diversity really mirrors the population that we serve and that our diversity is self-sustaining. And it's self-sustaining because of the inclusive climate that we hit, we have here at FSCJ. Monica, I love that so much. And I feel like an example of moving in that direction was the appointment of Lisa Moore as Chief Diversity Officer over the summer. Woo -woo. So Lisa, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what Monica is saying, because they definitely build on each other. Absolutely, and, and Monica was very eloquent in, in what she shared. And just to echo, um, you know, we have resources that uh, the college community as well as the outside community can access. We have the college equity report. We have the student success report. We have a college fact book that gives data on our demographics as well as demographics of our service area. And those are very important. And to Monica's point, we have to understand, are we mirroring that? And that goes back to also all of our discussions around inclusion. If I am big, if inclusion is my way of work, then I am seeking diversity because not just for the exterior, as Monica so eloquently pointed out, I want the difference of ideas. That's what makes us stronger. I also want to add when we're thinking about diversity, so there's the demographic piece, but diversity is important in that it expands our problem solving. It expands our responses. It encourages our creativity. It encourages, as Monica said, our retention and recruitment, not only at a student level, but also at a staff level. If I see myself reflected somewhere, I feel included, I feel valued, and I wanna be a part of that. We have a great start here at FSCJ. We, we have a lot of diversity in many forms. We need to build upon that, and we can build upon that, and that obviously is one of my goals is working with the college to look at how we build that. Um, I want to add uh, a quote. I am a Maya Angelou fan and she has a quote that I have written in many places many times and she says we all should know that diversity makes for a rich tapestry and we understand that all the threads are equal in value no matter the color. We're all important. All of our experiences are important. All of our perspectives are important. Everything we can bring to the table just makes FSCJ a better, stronger place. I love that, Lisa. That's awesome. And, you know, sometimes it's big things and sometimes it's small things like the captioning on this video. The captioning on this video makes this video accessible and FSCJ has the ability to do that stuff if we just send it in. So, Heather, why don't you finish up this question for us? Yeah, you know, we talk a lot about what the um, inclusivity, but also looking at how we take and be a thought leader to take it into action, right? And so when I always think about um, how do we take these thoughts and feelings and things that we've been talking around the table and listening to our students, how do we bring that to an actionable piece that we can actually implement in our policies, whether that's in our procedures to really help our students. And so over the last couple of years, I've had the opportunity to really work on a great program that took those ideas of how do we get students right from the beginning to be successful, to own um, and learn from different students in the classroom and from their college community and build that bridge. And we really developed a first year experience program that looks at new curriculum that embeds diversity into the curriculum. Students have to partake in, and participate as much as we can. We want them to do that inside the classroom and outside the classroom, whether that's with student life and leadership, um, that's with diversity and social change, um, and we really want students to build that seamless piece between the classroom and the community and then taking it back home and bringing it back to their community. And I think it's been a great collaboration between academic affairs and student affairs to really bring this together um, and hope in that upcoming year when it's when every student is taking it and 
Associates of Arts degree, we're going to to see how that really changes our community and only makes it better. So I'm really excited to see that. I love that so much. And I love how you took a legislative action that made us teach this course to everybody and put diversity at the forefront in it. That's amazing. So as we wrap up today, I want to thank all my panelists for being here and sharing their wisdom and kickstarting the conversation on inclusive excellence. So Something to remember, and we talked about this, is that innovation blooms under three conditions. The first is collaboration of researchers across institutes and nations, and we're starting a global scholar program. The second is the development of tools that become the key to answer other questions. So kind of like Chris created this opportunity, now it's becoming a key to work in other situations. Um, and then the last one is bringing these varying points of view to the table. and letting them be creative and come up with great ideas. And so if you bring those three things together, we can really have some innovation. So I thought it was interesting that one of the most transformative inventions that came out of the 1918 pandemic was actually the window unit air conditioning since we're in Florida. So not only does that make our Florida summers bearable, but in actuality, when it came out in the 1930s, the South had been lagging behind since the Civil War and it was able to remove the heat and humidity so that industry would move down here. So it, it boosted our entire economy in the South. And so sometimes, you know, you don't think about something like that having such a broad impact, but that one invention made possible transatlantic flight, the computers we're on today, and even the servers, like Chris was saying, that are powering our internet, those have to have cold environments. So what new amazing concepts can we at FSCJ develop through inclusive excellence? So we got the conversation started today, and we look forward to having you and your ideas at the table. Well, it's not scripted, but we thought we'd give you a behind the scenes look at this talented crew. You know, I used to be on TV. I, I'm used to being a part of the crew. In fact, why don't you guys let me help, right? I just, uh, what happens if I press this button, right? Oh, oh. Well, sorry. Okay, better, better leave that to the, to the good guys. My bad, sorry about that. Thank you, Dr. Canil, and thanks to everybody who was on the panel. Now, as you may know, in a recent email from Dr. Avendano, we've established an office of diversity, equity, and inclusion that is working hard to develop programming surrounding all of these topics. What you want to do is watch for an email this afternoon. It includes a link to watch more from this panel and talks about ways that you can help and ways that you can get involved as we work uh, to assist others. This is also a good time to remind you that even though we aren't physically together right now, we're still connected and working toward the common goal to help our students achieve success. So let's hear from one of our professors who reached out from across the world to show us how he's doing from the German Embassy in Tel Aviv, Israel. Dear FSCJ colleagues, uh, best greetings from the German Embassy in beautiful Tel Aviv, Israel. Uh, sadly, we have a dress code at the embassy, so no pajama or costumes for me unless it is uniform. And I'm unable to bring pets. But it's casual Friday and the weekend is ahead. I know that these are difficult times and I wish you all the best for the coming year. Please stay healthy and I hope to see you in person very soon. Now, before we welcome Associate Vice President for Strategic Priorities, Dr. Deb Frontaine, to talk about the Visionary Impact Plan, it's time for another poll question. By the way, more than 800 people watching this stream right now among the FSCJ family. So FSCJ is committed to improvement to fulfill our mission of student success. What process improvement methodology has FSCJ adopted to help advance our effort? We have four choices. A, Agile, B, Six Sigma, C, Kanban, or D, Project Management Institute. Thanks for your participation so far. And again, we'll share the results after we hear from Dr. Deb Fontaine. So Deb, we're handing this ship over to you. Good morning, everyone. It's exciting to begin a new academic year working with such dedicated colleagues, and it's great to be able to see even just a few of you in person, albeit at a safe distance. This morning, I'm here to share with you our progress in strategic planning. 
Many of you recall that in January and February, we were afforded some fabulous opportunities to meet on the different campuses and centers uh, in person and share our successes and ideas for institutional growth as we gathered information to develop a new strategic plan. However, the challenges of COVID encouraged us to pause in that process and to move forward in a more purposeful way that would allow us to respond to the more immediate needs of our students and community while giving us the time necessary to design the right vision for the college's long-term strategic plan. With Dr. Avendano's guidance in early summer, three priorities were identified to establish the framework for our one-year strategic plan. And those priorities are in increasing enrollment, increasing retention and completion, and improving some of our processes at the institution. Through an inclusive process, work groups were convened to explore goals and objectives that would best support these priorities in our mission of improving student success. These work groups rep represented a wide variety of college stakeholders, staff, faculty, and administrators whose charge was to develop goals and objectives that would make a positive impact in one year's time. In each area, equity and the needs of our underrepresented populations have been at the forefront of the discussions. The slides that follow provide an overview of the goals supporting each priority, and specific actionable objectives were also developed by these work groups. But for brevity's sake, the 32 objectives um, are not listed in, in this presentation, but I do want to share that each of those objectives is being put into action by a representative team of college stakeholders. In all, we have over 100 faculty, staff, and administrators who are currently engaged in the support and implementation of the 2020 Visionary Impact Plan. And in genuine alignment with our convocation theme, these teams have embraced their work with passion and an eye towards innovation. The first priority, increasing enrollment, includes the following goals to implement communications and marketing strategies that highlight the value of FSCJ from start to finish, and create an increased emphasis on strengthening our alumni and employer engagement activities. We're also focused on building our partnerships or building on our partnerships with Nassau and Duval counties to increase matriculation of high school graduates to FSCJ. And we're also increasing enrollment or focusing on increasing enrollment of our non-traditional students through increased outreach in our ABE and GED programs, in addition to reaching out to local businesses and employers to identify opportunities to better serve their needs, particularly in this time. And finally, to promote easy access to FSCJ and its services, we're reviewing and developing some student-friendly web pages that will help guide our students on the path from inquiry to admission, in addition to clearly identifying important services. Once we get our students in the door though, we want to keep them, but not for too long. So we wanna make sure that we are building clear paths forward for the students so that we can provide them the support they need to achieve their goals in a timely manner. To support our efforts in retention and completion, we're continuing with the development of the academic pathways that you just heard about earlier this morning to help take the guesswork out of the course sequencing and programs of study. With the increased need currently for online instruction, we've also placed a focus on classroom retention strategies, particularly in the online environment, to help support student success and begin to close equity gaps in achievement. And finally, we're focused on the need to support our students outside the classroom with the appropriate and timely use of simplicity tools and other student referral resources, as well as reaching out to our students who are close to graduation to provide support, guidance, and encouragement to reach that goal of completion. Our final priority involves a focus on improving our processes, particularly at the college level, to increase efficiency. The first goal involves six initial college level core processes, which we heard about last week at our on point. Um, we're working on improving our application process, developing an e-signature process to improve document workflow, uh, working on um, strategic awarding of financial aid to align with awarding at parts of terms, improving our drop for no pay process to minimize impact on enrollment and improve student satisfaction, align hiring process across the institution, 
and improving our work reporting and payment processes for adjuncts and overloads. These projects are currently under development under the leadership of Dr. Kip Strasma, the Executive Director of Project Development, and using the tools of Six Sigma, a continuous improvement methodology, well, we should be able to complete those and then add as the, as the year goes on. The second goal springs from the first and that its objectives provide opportunities for the college community at large to engage in learning about Six Sigma strategies and other continuous improvement methodologies so that they can be applied in our areas. Look for opportunities to learn more through strategic planning updates and AFPDs with topics on continuous improvement. This is just a brief high level introduction to the 2020 Visionary Impact Plan and to learn more and to keep informed, we'll continue to communicate progress in a variety of ways. In addition to using the Blue Wave News and On Point updates, opportunity to, opportunities to learn more will be available through AFPD courses and the strategic planning webpage. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to share the strategic plan with you this morning. I encourage you to please reach out to me if you have feedback, questions or comments. In closing, I hope that this is, I know this will be, a very exciting year for us, filled with passion, perseverance, and purpose, and I look forward to working with you throughout the year. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Fontaine. Uh, now it's time to announce our poll results. More than 78% of you voted for B. Six Sigma, and which incidentally is the correct response. So nice job today. You know, at times like these, it's really important to remember those who aren't really able to connect with the outside world. And it's also an opportunity for us to give back in, in ways that we can. This is why we're partnering with Four Acre Hills Rehabilitation and Nursing Center. It has residents who would love to hear from you. If you have the opportunity, Take some time to participate in this program. You'll soon receive an email from FSCJ Communications. It has more information about how you can support this initiative. What we're going to do is write heartwarming letters to the residents who need a little pick-me-up, something that we can all use at this time. So please make certain that you're on the lookout for that information, and we can all benefit from getting more involved in this program and in our community. Well, uh, that's about it from my part of this presentation. You know, uh, classes start Monday. I need to get back to work, nose to the grindstone, preparing for classes. You know, no rest for the weary. So hopefully I didn't forget anybody or anything today. It's been fun. Thanks and have a great day. Oops, almost forgot. One more thing. While we appreciate you hanging out with us this morning, we do have a little bit more relaxing to do. We've got uh, first our alma mater, which is being performed by students in the FSCJ Chorale, and then it's the keynote address from Dr. Avendano. Stay with us. It's going to be a good time. <laughs> trust creativity respect for diversity
So how cool was that? You know, in the baseball world, they call that the walk-up music. And mine just happens to be the FSCJ alma mater. So again, I want to express my deep appreciation to professor and COVID survivor, Tommy Shepard. Tommy, thank you for reviving and revising our alma mater with your contributions and for your ongoing success story and inspirational story. Thank you. And good morning to FSCJ. Welcome to Convocation 2020. Again, it is truly an honor to welcome everyone this year through our new virtual format. And wow, what a difference a year makes. Last year, I had the opportunity to address the FSCJ community in a rather filled gymnasium with over 900 people in attendance and just a handful of people who were out there virtually. And then this year, I can just see the option that you all really preferred. But seriously, I do appreciate you all tuning in this morning to Convocation 2020 from hopefully what is the safety and comfort of your own personal space. And while we can't be personally together for the health and the wellness of everybody, you know, the social and virtual distancing has not stopped or prevented us from communicating nor carrying forward our mission and our purpose. Let me first say thank you to the committee who have coordinated all of our virtual events and of course to our AV and technical staff who are coordinating and managing all the, all the technological needs that we have here today and putting on Convocation 2020. Please say, say, please say thank you to all of them when you see them. You don't know how much is going on behind the scenes, but there's a tremendous amount of work that goes on to putting on a production like this. Thank you also to Professor Joe LaBarbera, no matter where you are. It's always a blast working with you, and don't forget to put on your sunscreen. I know the sun doesn't shine much up in, in Green Bay, but don't forget to do that. And also, as always, I want to begin by welcoming and acknowledging the District Board of Trustees who have taken the time to be with us here this morning. And over this past year, I've come to know and greatly appreciate their interest and their commitment for education and for FSCJ. And to a person, I can assure you that they have the best interest of the college in mind. They have been a great support to me, and they've been strong advocates for FSCJ and for all of you. And again, to a person, they have said that FSCJ is poised for greatness. And they also firmly believe that we can overcome any obstacles or challenges that are in our way. And I agree wholeheartedly. FSCJ has been through a lot over the years, and this past year was really no different. We faced things like the threat of Hurricane Dorian, a worldwide pandemic, economic and employment upheaval, civil unrest, and the possibility of hosting a national convention a mile and a half down the road from one of our campuses. And so I want to thank the board and I want to thank all of you for testing me through the challenges in year one. And I can't wait to see what year two brings. It was truly a strange year to say the least. And hence the theme for this year's convocation, evolving with innovation, passion, perseverance, and purpose. The fact of the matter is we have to have each of these traits because the reality is that we cannot just close our eyes and wish these disruptive events away. So let's face it, all of these major disruptions are all still here. I know that we are still in hurricane season and nothing showed that more than yesterday. I know that COVID-19 does not plan to make an exit anytime soon. The unemployment insecurities will continue to impact the lives of the citizens and the residents in our community. And then we saw again this week where civil and social unrest will continue to knock on this country's door until it is addressed. And we will have an election in November. So you see, we must find ways to continue to be innovative in the light of all of these disruptions. We must be passionate about the work that we do so we can demonstrate our commitment to our mission and purpose for all of those that we serve. Perseverance is the only option we have to continue to be successful as an organization. And we must succeed because our students, our community, and the workforce depend on us, and we depend on it. I had shared at last year's convocation and the months that followed how I had encountered FJC, FCCJ, 
and FSCJ alumni essentially every single day. And honestly, if it weren't for the arrival of COVID, I know that I would have had encountered more former FSCJ students or parents every single day since March until probably today. In fact, even in the limited interactions I've had with people during the COVID season, I am still encountering FSCJ alums and current students. And while it may not be too surprising given our size and our 50 year plus history, the responses I get when I ask them about their experience at FSCJ is something that I think we all need to hear. And so it's interesting. And I can be a little scary because in my role, and I've been advised in the past to be careful and be prepared for whatever answer I might get based on the question that is asked. So what I think is important for all of you to hear is the regard that our students and our community have for our college and the appreciation and respect that they have for all of you who've helped them along the way. That's important for us to hear because many times we tend to be our own worst critics or we tend to hear that single voice out there that's overly critical of the college. So even, even though we've been through a turbulent past, we are still appreciated and we are still valued by this community and the students that we serve. And even through a turbulent past, we are still poised for greatness. Now having said that, I know that we can't just rest on our laurels. We know and we freely admit that we're not perfect and we can do better. Even to think that we can do better is truly saying something when you think about this. So consider this. In the past 13 months, FSCJ has received recognitions, awards, and points of distinction at the individual level, at the student level, and at the institutional level. Accolades such as Professor Christina Goodell being named the regional recipient of the 2019 Accreditation Council for Business Schools and Programs Teaching Excellence Award and Professor of Histology, Dr. Jerry Santiago, receiving the 2019 Lee G. Luna Foreign Travel Scholarship from the National Science for Hist Histotechnology. And Business Solutions Strategist, Betsy Santiago, was awarded the Professional Minority Woman Award from the Jacks Chamber Professional Women's Council. And Dr. Mary James was selected as the Phi Theta Kappa Honor Society's 2020 Faculty Scholar. And these are just a few of the individual honors recognized from FSCJ, and I do truly apologize for not having the time to mention everyone over the course of this past year, because there were many, many more. And for our students and student organizations, our Phi Theta Kappa returned to a five-star chapter. Fifty-four of our FSCJ student athletes received academic awards, and that's over half of all the athletes we have in all of our sports. And our very own Student Government Association President Sequoia Williams was selected as the SGA President of the Year for the entire Florida College system. And then at the institutional level, we hit some high marks as well. FSEJ was named as a finalist by the American Association of Community Colleges in three separate categories, which is unheard of to have that done in a single year. We were finalists for AACC's awards for excellence in the areas of advancing diversity, safety planning, and student success. FSCJ's own marketing and communications team was recognized by the Association of Florida Colleges for a number of awards, including first place for the Blue Wave newsletter. And the marketing department also received a national award from the National Council of Marketing and Public Relations. Even our own governor, Ron DeSantis, set us up for greatness by awarding FSCJ a Florida Jobs Growth Grant in the amount of $3.67 million to create and strengthen the workforce in the financial technology area. And then finally, Florida State College of Jacksonville was named as one of the top 150 U.S. community colleges by the Aspen Institute. And considering that there are over 1,200 community colleges in the U.S., that speaks to the quality of institution we have and the education that we provide to our students and to our community. And yet, we know we can do better. 
Again, these are just a few of the highlights this past year, and I only wish that I could name all of the highlights. I wish I had that kind of time. So I apologize if I did not name, specifically name one of yours in the list that I had presented. But if the opportunity still presents itself, I may still mention a few more highlights in the second hour of my presentation. So let's set our sights on the upcoming year and the years ahead. As an institution, what can we expect to see? I bring our attention to the theme for the day. Innovation, passion, perseverance, and purpose. For the 2020-21 school year, we will carry out our adapted strategic plan or 2020 visionary impact plan that you saw presented by Dr. Fontaine that is focused on student success, developing enrollment growth strategies, and strengthening our processes along with re-engaging in the process for our external and internal stakeholders in planning for the future. In the early results from this past year, we know that we need to develop and expand our programming and offerings at our centers, specifically Nassau and Cecil Center. Both communities are expanding and positioned for growth. It's our responsibility to be there. We need to be deliberate in serving those areas. We've already begun by partnering at Cecil Center with a new charter school, San Jose Tech, which is scheduled to be completed about a year to a year and a half from now. We will be assessing our offerings at Nassau County and our Nassau Center, and we'll be pur purposeful in our outreach to that community. We know that a significant number of students from the four high schools in Nassau don't pursue post-secondary education anywhere. FSCJ is the best option they have, and we plan to market to them directly. In addition to Nassau and the western part of our district, we know we need to examine all of our underserved areas. That will be part of our purpose as well this year. If we are to be this community's college, then we will be purposeful in reaching out to our underserved communities in ways that we've never done before. That will provide greater access contribute to our overall enrollment strategies, and create real opportunities for our citizens and for the workforce. In addition to being purposeful and intentional in our outreach, I am confident that we will continue to be innovative in how we deliver instruction, where we deliver instruction, and when we deliver instruction. This past year has required us to be innovative in many different ways. We must ride that momentum of innovation well into the future and my deep appreciation to everyone who was flexible over the course of the past five, six months to bring instruction, quality instruction, to all of our students. So beyond our mission and purpose, I look to our college to also be a leader in this community as we address the issues of diversity, equity, inclusivity, and racism. I know these will be tough conversations, and they will be uncomfortable for many. I understand that. I get that. However, these issues don't resolve themselves. And we are not completely fulfilling our mission in serving our community if we stick our head in the sand and do not respond. As you heard early in the alma mater, respect for diversity is a core value at FSCJ. And so we must remember our past and learn from it. It was 60 years ago today that our community witnessed the tragic events that unfolded following what was to be a peaceful civil rights demonstration in our community. Axe Handle Saturday is a dark spot in our community's history. While we've made strides since that horrific day, we must not forget what so many endured in an effort to gain the same rights that they had always deserved. As the community's college, we will remain a resource for building a better community to all those who come through our doors. My intent today is not to add to the political arguments swirling around our country. That's not our role. My intent today is to remind us of our mission and our role as an open door institution. We are open to anybody. We must provide opportunities for everyone. We must provide opportunities for civic engagement and critical thinking to our students in order to navigate these times and be part of a change for good. That's part of education as well, to help them engage in something that's bigger than them beyond learning just the skills that are necessary for the workforce. 
Thomas Jefferson is quoted as saying, educate and inform the whole mass of the people. They are the only sure reliance for the preservation of our liberty. And so, ladies and gentlemen, that is our mission. That is the mission of this community's college. And we have a lot to be proud of at FSCJ, and we know we still have a lot to do. We have been innovative, persistent, passionate about our mission and the students that we served. This is also what I've learned this past year. And while you may not think so, with everything that had taken place this past year was an amazing year for me. It truly was. Again, I listened and I learned. I assessed and I tried to communicate what I had heard. I plan to continue to do that this coming year, regardless of what COVID has planned. My goal, our goal, our expectation is to continue to be the best institution in the country, and that has not changed and will not change. And I've heard some of the whispers of what others think needs to be changed. And I must say this, there has not been one organization that's been able to change overnight. Improvement and excellence and commitment, it's a process unto itself. It is a commitment to excellence. It is a culture that is built on that commitment. And if I may, I'm gonna relay one Chicago land story. As many of you may have seen over the course of this past year, in the ESPN um, documentary of The Last Dance, the Chicago Bulls were the team that I kind of grew up watching. They had drafted a young man out of North Carolina, Michael Jordan, in 1984. And they did not win a championship in 1984. They didn't win a championship in 1985 or in 1986. It wasn't until 1991 when they won that first championship, seven years later. And then they dominated after that. And even Michael Jordan would tell you he would have never done it alone. It took a team and it took an organization committed to that level of excellence to get to that point. And that's our goal. That's my goal. And I hope that's your goal as well. And so in my mind, it's also about having a passion for what we do and for who we serve. I already know that we can persevere. I only need to look at this past year, these past few years of FSCJ. And as we continue to persevere, let's strive to thrive as an organization. Let's take this moment in history and show our community that FSCJ is their college. Let's take this moment in history and make it a time when our community looks back and sees that FSCJ was the light that shined the way for all of them. Again, I want to thank each and every one of you, the work that you do to serve our students, to serve our community, and to serve each other. I wish you all a fantastic and safe school year, and I look forward to seeing you all live and in person in the near future. Thank you, and have a fantastic year to the FSEJ family. Thank you. And now, in closing, Today, I want to again start by thanking all of the presenters and the performers, and certainly our MC, Professor Joe LaBarbera, a little more sunscreen, Joe. I must also again acknowledge those who helped make our first ever virtual convocation possible. The whole team of faculty and staff from across the college put a lot of time and energy into all the details, and there were a lot of details behind the scenes that work that made this event possible. So thank you to all of you. To the entire planning committee, thank you. It would take me far too long to name each and every one of them, but you will see their names listed in the program today. Again, thank you to all of you. And finally, to all of you who have joined us today, thank you for making this a priority in your day. I know there is a lot going on as we prepare for the beginning of the academic year, and I also know how different this year's event was due to our inability to be physically present with each other. I resisted the opportunity to bring out my, my uh, little magic mirror to see where everybody was, but I know that you're there. So regardless, I hope that you also share in my excitement for what is to come in the days and the months and the school year to come. Again, I leave you with safe and healthy times for you and your family, and I wish you a fantastic school year and I look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you, FSCJ.